Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our channel. My name is Lindsay from Moon Prep. Moon Prep provides one on one counseling services for students, in particular for those pursuing BSMD or direct medical programs, as well as medical school. Make sure to like and subscribe to be the first to hear more from our team. Hello everyone, my name is Lindsay. I am a counselor at Moon Prep, um, and today I have a special guest with us. Um, can you please tell me a little bit about your background and what brought you to a Caribbean medical school? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm Dr. Heidi Chumley. I'm a family physician uh, by training. Went to medical school in San Antonio, did my residency in San Antonio. Uh, also there did a, a fellowship in uh, academic medicine. And, uh, and then went on to leadership roles, at, at, you know, there, there, but then also uh, at University of Kansas School of Medicine. And it was while I was there at University um, of, of Kansas that, uh, that I learned that, you know, every year we had um, 100 qualified candidates from the state of Kansas that, that we didn't have room for in our, in our medical school. And I always wondered about where they went. Um, and so when I was recruited uh, to an international medical school in the, in the Caribbean, and I went there for the interview, it just, you know, hit me, this is where the qualified students are that for, you know, that there's not room for um, in the U.S. schools. And it was at that moment, you know, more than 10 years ago, you know, now that I decided that's really where I want to spend my, spend my time and my, and my energy. And, and, uh, and I've never looked back from then. Amazing. Perfect. Okay. And so what would you say, obviously, I guess I should preface this by saying Caribbean medical schools, international medical schools do have a bit of a stigma sometimes attached to them. Um, so what would you say are the advantages and disadvantages of attending a Caribbean medical school? Yeah, you're right. The disadvantage is really the stigma. Um, it, it's, it, and it's not sometimes, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's all the time. And uh, it's something I think that, uh, that is important for, for students to, to realize. It comes from a number of misperceptions. And so we do what we do, we, we can do to help correct those, those misperceptions. And you know, certainly if you go to one of the um, one of the better known uh, schools in the Caribbean that's been around for a long time, accredited, you know, you're gonna get a really solid um, education. You're gonna, you're gonna be able to pass and do well on your licensing exams. You're gonna you know, be in a really good position to get into a residency in the U.S., which is what everybody um, wants to do. So, so that, you know, feel confident and comfortable in, in that. But the advantage, I think the advantage that, that people don't uh, really understand well is it is an amazing experience to live in another country, right? You, there is nothing like being immersed in a different healthcare system, a, a different population, uh, Ross Med is in Barbados. It's an it's an emerging country. You know, it has a has a there is a whole lot to to learn about yourself. There's a whole lot to uh, that that helps you expand your own you know worldview, and all those things are going to just bring you some advantages as you begin to practice uh, medicine. Amazing. Okay, that's really good to hear. Uh, you kind of alluded to this a little bit in your like introduction. Um, how is Ross University School of Medicine like specifically increasing access to medical education? Yeah, simply by admitting students are are being denied the opportunity. Right. I think that's the that's the uh, that's the big um, piece of it. And and you know how how an applicant looks at the time that they're applying for medical school depends a lot on the opportunities that they've had in life. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that is, I think, uh, something that, you know, we still have in the U.S., the still the system for selecting people for medical school does, uh, does select for, uh, for people who um, have an advantaged educational background for, for higher socioeconomic uh, status. And, and they're still um, I believe, <laughs> not now speaking, this is my own belief, that there is some, um, you know, systemic uh, bias that selects against people of, of color, that people are working really hard to, to eliminate, but, but it's still, but it's still there. Um, so, you know, by, by providing an additional uh, opportunity, I think that's, that's a big piece of it, but it's not, it's not enough. Um, one of the things that, that I find is really true is you've got to reach people 
before they give up on their dream of being a physician. Um, many of our students are just hearing from, you know, early in life that, you know, you can't be a physician. That's not for you. You don't belong to this elite club. And it's, it is, um, you know, really working to, to overcome that for the group of people who, who really um, are, want to be physicians. And so how is Ross doing that? Are you guys like going more to universities at like a younger age? What's kind of the steps that, that you all are taking to, yeah. to like encourage people? Yeah. To yeah, absolutely. We do get out to, uh, to many universities, uh, try to reach students, you know, before they um, fail at organic chemistry and decide, you know, <laughs> for whatever reason, that means they can't be a doctor, you know, that's can counteract some of those those messages um, early on. And, and, you know, one of the other ways that we're really working on this is through our partnerships with um, HBCUs and, and HSIs. And in, in those institutions are amazing, amazing um, people. And we want to, to, you know, deliver a very clear message that you belong in medicine and, uh, and we'd like to be your partner to, to get there. Nice. Okay. And so when you are evaluating candidates, maybe ones who do have, who have failed, um, you know, or an organic chemistry, um, what do you prioritize in your evaluation? Like, what are you really looking for in your, in your candidates? Yeah, I have an advantage. We have an advantage out at, uh, you know, at, at Ross Med, other schools in the, in the um, Caribbean, in that we have more flexibility in our class size, yeah. right? So, and we have multiple starts in a year. So, so when I was at a U.S. school, um, or, or the two U.S. schools I was at before, when you're there with a fixed class size, you really do have to evaluate, is candidate A better than candidate B? And you got to put them up on a list. When you have more flexibility, like we do, you can take a whole different mindset. It's not, it's more than what people talk about when it's, when they, they say a holistic approach. It is, can candidate A make it? We'll, we'll admit that, can candidate B make, can, you know, do they have what, what we need? We can accept both of those students. We don't have to say one is better than the other. And so really what we are looking at when we're evaluating candidates is, you know, or because everyone has strengths and, and challenges. Are, are the challenges that, that they have, are these challenges that we have resources and experience in, uh, in supporting students through? And if we believe, that we can um, support students who have had, you know, probably the most common one is, is uh, some more difficulties uh, academically. Um, other ones are people who've gone on and done another career. They've been out of the classroom for a long time. You know, when we uh, have the confidence that we can uh, support whatever challenges the students have, then we can offer admission. And we don't have to say one, one set of challenges is better than another. Um, and we can, you know, do what, what we can do to help, help support. Perfect. Um, and kind of building off of that, are there like specific services that you do offer your students to help them succeed when they are on campus? We absolutely, absolutely. You know, every, everyone is a unique individual, right? So, so, and, and they come with such differences in in their in their preparation for for medical school. So so I would say we put things into probably three different buckets, right? There's there's your um, there's your academic supports. So your peer tutors, peer mentors, your faculty advisor. Uh, you're part of a learning community. Uh, we've got a team of learning strategists that really help uh, students, you know, and how how they think about uh, think about studying. So there's that academic level support and we um you know it's not just it's not just there if you if you want to have it if you are underperforming on the first test then uh then you're getting uh support <laughs> so it's coming at you so be, you know so be ready because we really want you know people to be successful so there's there's that piece i think the other piece is really it, it, um working on the the confidence and be, belonging yeah you know, i talked a little bit about that that earlier um, sometimes what's impeding your success is really just believing in in yourself, you know, and 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 being part of a, a community. So we've got a strong wellness team. We do a number of things to really help uh, people feel feel part of 
the medical profession. Um, and part of that really is, is from very early, we want you in that white coat, we want you out in the community, we want you seeing yourself as a physician because when the studies get hard, because they do, we want you motivated to continue <laughs> to continue them. Perfect. And thanks to these initiatives, have you seen like a change in attrition rates for Black, Hispanic, like student of color, um, students of color or anything like that? Yeah. Yeah. So I would talk about that in, in three phases. So before the pandemic um, had almost, I mean, had nearly eliminated any, what I call the disproportional impact of, of um, you know, race or ethnicity on, on academic uh, performance. As we went through the pandemic, as did, I think everyone did, uh, you, you saw um, students who had, uh, who came from disadvantaged backgrounds, who had uh, differences in, in socioeconomic status, they struggled more uh, through the pandemic than students who had more more resources, and um, and so we saw we saw some uh, you know weakening of the the outcomes around then. As we've been able to get back, uh, and and now you know everybody's been back for for a year for a year and a half um, pretty much now. Um, we've been able to to eliminate those again. It's you know it's a um, uh, it, very um, very important, I think, really accelerated our understanding of what we call what we call the social determinants of learning, right? You know, so so there's social determinants of of health. Our sister school coined that phrase. I don't get credit for that that phrase, but the social determinants of learning and really, you know, what are um, how can what what are all the things that affect a person's learning, and how can you uh, support those? And and yes, when you when you do that, you eliminate the disparities. Amazing. Okay. And so continuing to talk a little bit about the pandemic, um, has it caused, I know we kind of saw like the Fauci effect where we saw a huge increase in med school admissions uh, or med school applications. Um, have you seen that as well at Ross University? Um, has it kind of tapered off now that the pandemic has started to, to ebb a little bit? Yeah. So there was one year of a big bump in applications. And I think you, you, when it happens, that sort of happens uh, everywhere. And then it's, it's come, it's come down, you know, back to pre pandemic uh, levels for, you know, last year. And then, and then the season that we're in uh, the season that we're in now. So that was the, that was one piece of it. I, I'd say the other piece of it is, you know, we will um, now, and probably for the next several years, see, students who've had a very disrupted college um, education, right? So, so, you know, there was a, a point in time where, um, and, and people's view of the, the health care system, you know, as, as, you know, either that has motivated a lot of people or has, it's the, you know, this isn't, this isn't uh, for me. So, so I think those two things about the pandemic, uh, you know, also have, have, have changed a bit uh, what, what students look like now that they're coming to medical school. Mm -hmm. And so obviously we talked a little bit about like academic preparedness, it's been more disrupted, but have you noticed like a change in like clinical and resume, um, resumes that were sent in with the medical school applications? Do you think that they're as prepared for medical school on that front too? Yeah. Um, no, they're not as prepared. And it, it probably even goes beyond you know, there were not as many shadow, there were no, no shadowing opportunities, right, really during the, during the pandemic, except for, uh, for a very elite group of, of students whose parents were doctors or, you know, whatever, there's very few people were able to, to do that. Um, volunteer work, uh, you know, the, those opportunities were also, um, you know, fewer, but, the, the interesting thing, the the opportunities to to be in class and work together. I mean, those are those are so um, so formative and important. And and uh, you know, fortunately now I think we're beginning to see see people come back together um, again. But you know, there was that point in time for everything where we're like, oh well, I can I can do this virtually by myself in my in my room and and medicine's really a team sport, you know, and, and medical education is really a team sport and and getting, you know, having the skills to to work together uh, and and help each other, you know, those are those are things I I think that are hard to hard to you know measure and really um, quantify, but but we've seen we've seen that. 
as uh, as students have come through. And do you think that will affect their like preparedness when they enter into the workforce? Or do you think like the, you know, four years of medical school will kind of help level the playing field a little bit better? Well, we have to. I mean, we've got to close the gap by then, right? <laughs> but um, but yes, yeah. No, I do. And again, you know, I think the the earlier we can begin to get uh, the students back, you know, first day of medical school, first week of medical school, let's let's really be introducing you to the profession and and uh, and get you caught up on those some of the experiences you may not have had. Perfect. Uh Okay, and do you anticipate it kind of returning back to like a, a level of normal, 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 level of normal? I don't know how to say that. <laughs> hey, um, level of normal again now that the pandemic has kind of slowed down a bit. Who knows, right? I mean, I, I think I think we're in a new normal. I, you know, that's the phrase everybody is uh, using. I think we'll probably see interest in medicine um, stay at a pretty pretty similar to what it was uh, pre-pandemic, uh, but, but you know, who, who knows what will come next? Yeah. Okay. Have you seen a change in um, like majors that kids are applying to medical school with, or has it stayed pretty consistent with, you know, mostly science with some mixture of the humanities, or has it started to shift a little bit more? Yeah. Um, we see, we have always out at, at the schools in the Caribbean, we've always seen such a wide uh, range of, of of um, majors and studies that 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 people are doing, and that's actually good. I mean, you've got to you've got to have your science um, prerequisites, and but you don't you really don't have to major <laughs> in the sciences. We're gonna we're gonna teach you plenty of that. Um, you know, know something about the world, know something about other cultures. You, you know, those those um, be able to communicate well. I, anything that really helps you uh, do those are gonna are gonna help prepare you uh, to do well in medical school. So most people still do. I you know if you think about I I think the uh, you know people still think of uh, your science degrees as really what you need um, for medicine, but but you can get to medicine through any through any degree. Yes, yeah, completely agree. Okay. And so when they're on campus, um, what kind of like hands-on learning opportunities do they have? Great, yeah. So we um, have, oh goodness, where to, where to start, where to start? So so all of our first semester students um, get to uh, be out in the community three or four different uh, times. They are working at, uh, for example, pop-up clinics. So pop-up clinics are, uh, you know, clinics that you go in place where people are that that don't have access to other places. We have a partner that, um, uh, an urgent care partner that that has a mobile van. So they work on the mobile uh, van and it goes to, to uh, different places. There are um, more traditional uh, clinics that they go to. There is a homeless uh, shelter that, that we uh, help and provide um, care for. And then there are large scale um, I, you know, health health fair type events. You know, where you're trying to attract people in, uh, get their blood pressure uh, taken, uh, talk to them about about important health um, issues. Uh, we've got students in the uh, in the schools uh, working with the kids on on um, obesity prevention, nutrition, uh, the many many um, many many opportunities. Amazing, cool. Uh, and then another elephant in the room, which is always the path for a lot of kids, at least the path back to the U.S. Um, how do you help like mentor them and making sure that they do match into residencies when they go through that process? Um, how do you help them through that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we have a really high residency attainment rate, you know, for the just it's it's good. And I think it, you know, it certainly is going to come from from a number of things uh, going to a, a well-known long established school is is going to be really um, important. There are, you know, 15,000, 8,000, you know, alumni who have come before you that that, you know, people have a good have a good impression of the the students that come that come out of those those schools. So that's one piece of it. Um, you have to perform well academically. You're taking and passing the same exams that your that your um, counterparts are. And, you know, 
half of medical school is in, in your clinical settings. And, uh, you know, our, so, so our students are back in their clinicals in the U.S. They are right beside uh, people who are, you know, went to the state school or are or, or studying there in the U.S. Um, and, uh, and so ensuring that by the time they reach that first clinical, that they feel very comfortable in that setting, you know, that they're, that, that they've, um, had some clinical experience so that they know what to do there. And then the last thing I, that I think is just really important is helping people um, talk about the advantages of studying in the Caribbean. Some of the things we talked about right at the, the beginning, the, you know, what did you learn about different healthcare systems and, and populations of people and how policy affect, and, you know, those are all things that can make you uh, really stand out in a, in a residency um, interview. Perfect. Okay. Really interesting. Okay. Um, now, do you have any advice for any students applying to medical school for the upcoming cycle? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's always such a, you know, it's so funny. I, it's been a long time, but I remember that phase in my life, right? It's a very, um, it's a very stressful, uh, stressful time. So, you know, it is a, um, you want, you want to, you want to be very strategic about, about what you do, right? So, so when you get, um, when you're applying to a, a place, if you get an interview there, um, really being, uh, understanding what it is that they're going to be doing there. You know, every medical school does things just a little bit differently, or, you know, is it going to be on, on, is it going to be virtual? Or are you going to be in person? Some people are, you know, are doing that. You can be with a group. What's the day going to be like? Who are you going to be talking to? Just, it, are you, are they going to, you know, use a, an MMI approach? Are you, are you going to be asked to respond to scenarios? Know, know that about each, about each place, do your homework. Um, be ready to show them how you connect to their school, right? And whether that is because it is, um, you're from the same state. I mean, that's a, if you're interviewing in the, in the U.S., that's a, I think an important thing, but show the show the connection and of your, of yourself to to their um, program. And, and one other piece of advice I think I always give uh, give students that um, may may go unsaid a lot is that you know medical school is really is really hard, um, and admissions committees are often worried about people who haven't overcome anything in their lives, right? So, so a lot of times I think people want to just talk to, just talk to their strengths, just talk to, to all the good stuff that they've done. And what impression that leaves is, mm, I don't know, when the pressure cooker gets really hot, what's this person going to do? I, this is an untested um, person. So, so being very um, thoughtful about how you, how you present yourself, you know, obviously you don't want to you know, say things that people are like, nope, nope. But um, but how you how you present yourself as somebody who has um, has had disappointments in life and has figured out how to how to do that has maybe hasn't done um, you know made a mistake and uh, and what you learned from it and how you how you got how you got through that so so show people what you're made of you know <laughs> how you've been able to to bounce back and what you've been able to do and. And, uh, and I think those that, you know, th thinking about that carefully and, and, and how you want to weave that into your stories is something really important for people to, to do. Oh, yeah. So good advice for people to hear. Everyone's so scared to talk about mistakes and yeah. challenges. So yeah, that's, that's really good to hear. Yeah. And so going back to, oh, go for it. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, we, we, we want to know you, you've been tested and, and, uh, and <laughs> have come through. So that's a, it's a good quality to have. Very true. Uh, going back to what you said about the interview too, um, what is the interview like at Ross University? Is it traditional or MMI or a bit more of a hybrid? Yeah, um, it. I would say it is more. Um, it is more traditional uh, with a little bit of a, a difference. One of the one of the differences I would I would say is that by the time we get somebody to interview, we are really looking for. Um, are how we can take you right I mean we're, we're not the interview for us is is not, is not so much a weed out it is can we let us understand you and and uh, what 
what your challenges have been, and are we going to be able to really partner with you and help you help you meet meet those? So, so we're going to have a much higher um, acceptance rate after after the interview um, than than you would normally see uh, in the schools. But um, it's a it's a uh, it's an interview with and admissions uh, specialist generally just to to start with. They're going to ask you you know about your academic background. They're going to want you to explain. Um, any gaps in your in your training, they're going to ask you questions about about yourself and who you are and and why you're interested in medicine. You know, just kind of all the common um, the common uh, questions, and they're going to want to know just as anyone else does, what questions do you have about us? You know, and and uh, and so be prepared with um, with those. Okay. And is it virtual or is it in person? It's virtual. Yeah, okay. virtual. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I think my last question is, um, do you have any advice on for students on how to build their resume? Um, any like it, impressive extracurriculars or achievements you've seen from students past or just, you know, things in general that you kind of look for on a resume? Yeah, what a great, what a great question. Um, I look for passion, right? And, and passion can take so many different forms. And again, you know, the, the, Opportunities for extracurriculars and and et cetera are not you know even for everybody, right? But but everyone has the opportunity to find something that is important to them, think about how to make it better, and uh, and and learn to talk about that. And whether that's you know a big mission trip to Africa, or whether <laughs> you know, or whether that is what you do in your own backyard at, at your you know local community or, or, or church or with your siblings or the job, the two jobs that you held to, you know, to try to, uh, you know, contribute to your family's income, whatever it is that you are, that you're passionate about. Talk about that, you know, it's, it's, it's um, people can tell in the interview, you know, you tell when somebody is checking a box, you know, it's like, I, I you know, I did my 50 hours of community service that was part of this class. And, you know, and, and you can tell when you're checking a box or, or when you're really um, passionate about, um, about something. So good advice. Okay. Well, anything else um, you think that we should know about Ross University School of Medicine or um, about the, the program or anything at all? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I work there. I think it's so disclaimer, right? You know, um, I think it's an absolute fabulous uh, program. We'd love for people to take a look, uh, take a look at us. We, um, we uh, are, you know, definitely uh, interested in, in hearing from you, even if you struggled on your MCAT, even if you had trouble in, in organic chemistry, even if you haven't had the opportunity to shadow physicians or, or do we, um, We'd still love to hear from you. If you want to be a physician, let's let us take a look.